Last time, we left off trying to do what Galileo did. Guess the connection between the length and frequency of a vibrating string. From the observations we made last time, it's pretty clear that as the length of our string goes up, its frequency goes down. And as the length of our string goes down, its frequency goes up. However, if we're going to make specific predictions about the frequency of a given string, we need a more specific guess. Notice that when the length of our string doubles, our frequency is roughly cut in half. So when our length is multiplied by a factor of two, our frequency appears to be roughly multiplied by a factor of one half. And further, when the length of our string is cut in half, our frequency is approximately doubled. How can we capture this relationship mathematically? What mathematical relationship turns two into one half and one half into two? The operation we need here is the inverse. One divided by our length factor gives us our frequency factor. Mathematically, we can say that frequency is inversely proportional to length. This was Galileo's guess. Let's see how Galileo's guess holds up to Mersenne's experiments. As Feynman told us, we need to compute the predictions made by our guess before we compare it to experiment. Last time, we set up a second string with a tension of 3200 grams and observed a frequency of about 174 hertz at a length of 40 centimeters. Now, using our guess, let's predict the frequency of this string at a length of 80, 50, and 20 centimeters. Since going from 40 to 80 centimeters requires us to double our length, according to our educated guess, our frequency should be cut in half. So our original frequency of 174 hertz should become 87 hertz. This is our first prediction. The next prediction we need to make is for a string length of 50 centimeters. Since we're starting at 40 centimeters, changing our length to 50 centimeters is not a clean doubling or halving as before. So we might have to actually do some math. Statements of proportionality like ours can be a little inconvenient to work with. So let's change how we write our expression. Saying that one variable is proportional to another really just means that there's some constant out there that when multiplied by one variable gives us the other. If we call this constant of proportionality k, we can rewrite our statement of proportionality as an equation. f equals k times 1 over l. With one minor simplifying adjustment, we have f equals k divided by l. This equation says the same exact thing as our original proportionality statement, except now we've expressed our constant of proportionality k explicitly, making our relationship easier to work with. Mathematically, this formula completely captures the concept of inverse proportionality. So if someone tells you that two variables are inversely proportional, assuming they know what they're talking about, they don't just mean that when one gets bigger, the other gets smaller. They mean exactly this, that one variable equals some constant of proportionality divided by the other. Now that we have a slightly more useful version of our mathematical relationship, let's use it. We can use our initial string configuration, length equals 40 centimeters and frequency equals 174 hertz to compute our proportionality constant, k. Now that we have k, we can use it along with our formula to make predictions for our other string lengths at this tension. Plugging in our last two experimental lengths, 50 and 20 centimeters, we compute 139.2 and 348 hertz for our predicted frequencies. All right, after all that work, we finally have a guess at our hidden mathematical connection. Frequency is inversely proportional to length. We also have specific predictions, 87, 139.2, and 348 hertz, computed using our guess. It's finally time to experiment. Using our slow motion camera and counting vibrations, we measure frequencies of 91 hertz for our 80 centimeter string, 141 hertz for our 50 centimeter string, and 343 hertz for our 20 centimeter string. And if we compare our results to our predictions, it looks like our predictions are pretty good. In fact, our percent errors are 4.6, 1.3, and 1.4%. Not bad at all. And thanks to our high-speed camera, our results are actually more accurate than Mersenne's really long string and pendulum method. We have found our first scientific law. The frequency of a vibrating string is inversely proportional to its length. This relationship is known today as Mersenne's first law. And more importantly, we found a method, the scientific method that allows us to make these types of discoveries. That through observation, guessing, and experimentation allows us to explore the connection between mathematics and the physical world. 
that allows us to really probe the universe we live in. Now, Galileo's guesses and Mersenne's experiments are really just the beginning of the mysteries of the vibrating string. In the following 18th century, the brightest mathematicians and scientists of the day battled over a more complete mathematical description of the vibrating string. Resolving this controversy would require the creation of some very slick and incredibly useful mathematics. Differential equations and Fourier analysis. We'll save these stories for another day, and for now we have two final mysteries to solve. We've discovered Mersenne's first law, and thanks to Mersenne's experimental setup, he was able to discover two more laws governing the behavior of the vibrating string. Two more connections between mathematics and reality. Mersenne's second law tells us about the connection between a vibrating string's tension and frequency. And Mersenne's third law is about the connection between a string's mass and frequency. Let's see if we can discover Mersenne's final two laws using the scientific method. Just as before, we'll start by making some observations. First, we'll fix the length of our string to 60 centimeters, and measure the frequency as we change tensions. This relationship is a little trickier than our length versus frequency relationship, so we'll take more observations this time. Just as before, we'll go ahead and set up a second string configuration that we'll use to test our guesses next time. We'll make the length of this string 40 centimeters, and take one observation at a tension of 1,000 grams. And next time, we'll use our educated guess to make frequency predictions for this string at tensions of 4,000, 5,000, and 9,000 grams. Next, we'll explore one last connection between mathematics and vibrating strings. The connection between a string's mass and frequency of vibration. The guitar strings we're using here come in six varieties. We'll measure the mass of each string, but we need to be a little careful here. The mass of an entire string depends on its entire length. But in our experiments, we really only care about the section of string that we allow to freely vibrate. And we don't really want to have to recompute the mass of the vibrating section of each string each time we change its length. We can fix this problem by dividing our mass measurements by the full length of each string. The resulting number, our mass per unit length, tells us the mass of each one centimeter section of our string, allowing us to ignore the effect of the overall length of our strings and compare strings of different sizes more directly. Now, for a given length and tension, we'll measure the frequency of each string. And just as before, we'll set up a second configuration that we'll use to test our guesses. We now have some nice observations to help us make educated guesses at Mersenne's final two laws. Now, what do you think? What is the hidden mathematical connection between a vibrating string's tension and frequency? What is the hidden mathematical connection between a vibrating string's mass per unit length and frequency? For a closer look at our data and some additional observations, check out the PDF linked below. Good luck and thanks for watching.